Uh, you know, it was probably Cosmos that got me interested in uh, searching for extraterrestrial life. I'm sure that nearly everyone will say the same thing and blame Carl Sagan for this. <laughs> But even earlier than that, my mother, when I was probably three years old, uh, used to take me out into the yard, point up at the sky, and terrify me with the constellations because she didn't understand that I was too young to understand metaphors or, yes, she would actually point up at the sky and say, there's Cassiopeia, she's a queen sitting in her chair, and you know, it terrified me to think that there were people up in the sky looking down at me, sitting in their chairs. Uh, I, you know, so I ran inside screaming usually. <laughs> uh, and so I became an astronomer to uh, allay my fears of sky queens. After being terrified by my mother for 18 years, uh, I uh, went uh, to the University of Wisconsin, uh, got a degree, uh, my father convinced me that I would never be satisfied being a computer scientist. He said I should go for a, uh, uh, he said real scientist, sorry computer scientists. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, so I went into astronomy and physics, came here to Berkeley uh, after that and got a PhD in astronomy. Well, I joined Berkeley SETI, before it was a research center, it was just a SETI group, back in uh, 1998 when SETI at Home was just in its starting stages. And since then, I've mainly concentrated on radio SETI, uh, both uh, primarily SETI at Home uh, and its follow-on project, AstroPulse. And uh, yeah, we were not entirely surprised the first time we were uh, informed of a SETI at home wedding where people meet, met through SETI at home and got married. Uh, it's, uh, I think they just don't inform us of that anymore because you know, if you're not the first, uh, it's, uh, it's hard to get people excited about it. <laughs> there are some people who uh, that really want us to, uh, yeah, focus on, on the possibility of visitation. Right now, I've, you know, I, I have no reason to believe that we've been visited. I've never seen any evidence of a real extraterrestrial artifact. The stories are all fun and good, but they've evolved so much over time to become more uniform. The stories that we were telling in 1976 about alien beings and what they looked like were not the uh, tales that we tell now. They, they don't, they're not these short gray people with, you know, that walk around naked. That really was popularized by movies, the, the concept of little gray aliens. The aliens that were abducting people before then were typically huge and red and dressed in colorful clothes. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it seems unusual that the type of aliens that visit us would change just because we, someone made a movie. <laughs> so uh, I, I really don't think that we've been visited. I've seen unidentified flying objects and I've been able to identify them all eventually. It's <laughs> we haven't found anything and uh, when we do, we will follow the uh, the SETI protocol, which is, first thing is that uh, you do not call your government first. That's, <laughs> uh, yeah, so yeah, that's one of the conspiracy theories that all, uh, are, that a lot of people have about SETI is that, oh, well, we've already found things and we just can't tell anyone about it because it's all classified. Do you know how famous you would get if you found an extraterrestrial signal? <laughs> And it was proven. Uh, no, no one, no one would keep that secret. So, even to avoid the uh, the fear that you know governments might threaten, governments are not the first people you talk to. Uh, you uh, basically, it's the Ast International Astronomical Union is informed, and the. Uh, uh, 
Commission 51 of the IAU and the International Telecommunications Union is informed, and then you go to the UN, uh, and then you hold a press conference, and then you can tell your government. <laughs> uh, we'll let you know if we find something. <laughs>